In this video, we're gonna talk about how crap wheels led to the death of skateboarding in the 60s, how one man's invention brought skateboarding back from the dead, how the threat of nuclear war with Russia saved skateboarding, an accident with George Powell that would change wheels forever, some unbelievably weird trends in the wheel market, the dominance of Spitfire at the current wheel market, and so much more. I really honestly think this is one of the most interesting videos we've ever made, and if you like it, make sure you like, subscribe, and comment, and keep coming back for more. Tell your friends. My name is Levi, this is Shred Shop, connect you to skateboarding, and today we're talking about the history of the skateboard wheel. To tell the story of the skateboard wheel, we have to take you back, like so far back to the 1960s, to a tiny town called Purcellville, Virginia. Around 1956, a company called Humco becomes the first company to manufacture and sell skateboards as a product. Most of these boards were sold at grocery stores or department stores. In 1965, it was estimated that 50 million skateboards were sold that year, according to the Smithsonian Museum. After the explosion of sales, because the boards were so poorly made, came an explosion of injuries. So much so that doctors at the time nicknamed a broken elbow a skateboard fracture. The problem was that the original skateboard wheel was just wheels made of steel and they were free spinning on an axle. That means no bearings. Then in the 1960s, they invented clay wheels for roller skating and they were made up of clay clay, paper, plastic, nutshells, and glue. The problem with these wheels was that if you put them on a skateboard and at full speed you hit a rock, the wheels would explode, making them so dangerous. By January 1966, the first month of 1966, skateboarding sales plummeted, screeching to a halt and killing skateboarding. There were even countries like Norway that made skateboarding illegal because it was so dangerous. We've reached a final conclusion on item nine. Illegal! Here's a virtually unknown story that changed the trajectory of skateboarding forever. The story of modern skateboarding starts far from the beaches of California. In fact, it starts with a man named Vernon Heightfield in the small town of Purcellville, Virginia. In the late 60s, skateboarding is dead and non-existent. Vernon Heightfield was a Navy veteran that worked as an electrical engineer. His employer at the time took a job with the defense contractor, the North American Aerospace Defense Command, which we know today as NORAD. It was a joint effort between the Canada and US governments to keep an eye out for aerospace and marine attacks. Because of the Cold War, everyone was scared of nuclear explosions. So Heightfield was charged with the job of designing antennas that could be buried in the ground and survive nuclear war. He was introduced to a substance called polyurethane. They were wrapping the antenna in it and burying it. This material contains the properties of both rubber and plastic, but is neither. He starts experimenting with this material and making all sorts of inventions at his house. Then one day he's watching his son at the roller skating rink who's struggling on clay wheels. So he makes his son a set of urethane wheels for his roller skates in a cupcake tray in his garage. After they use them, he realizes they're a way superior product and you can make them in all sorts of fun colors. Heightfield brings them to the local roller rink and they put in a huge order for these wheels. An order so big that he goes full time making these wheels. By the late 1960s, his engineering firm goes out of business. He gets a $10,000 loan to start his wheel factory and calls it Creative Urethane. He bought a farm and started his own factory. He was shaving down the wheels with an old deli slicing machine and the entire thing was powered by engines from old washing machines that he bought from a laundromat that closed down. He really was an inventor. And by the 2010s, he's the biggest skateboard wheel manufacturer in the world. He became the godfather of urethane products, even outside of the skateboard industry. He was quoted saying, if you can draw it, we can build it. Frank Nosworthy moved around a lot as a kid. As a son of a US Navy captain, his dad was a liaison for NATO. And as fate would have it, they ended up living in a small town in Virginia. Frank studied engineering at Virginia Tech, but he gets kicked out of school for protesting the Vietnam War. He was a surfer, and on the weekend he would make the long drive to the coast if the weather permitted. And in the week, to fill the void, he would ride a skateboard. In the summer of 1970, Frank went to visit a friend of a friend, Tom Heightfield, who you might remember from the earlier part of the story. They happened to visit Tom's dad's factory, Creative Urethanes. And when they left, they took some factory reject wheels and tried to put them on their skateboard. This changed everything. They were so soft, so smooth, offered better traction and rode so much smoother on rough surfaces. They also took away all the risk that the explosion of the clay wheel had. This might be the most monumental moment in skateboard history, changing everything. In 1971, he moves to Encinitas, California and he brings these urethanes with him. They had loose ball bearings inside, so it wasn't a case bearing, which was a pain, but also meant that they would fit on all different shapes of boards. And remember, this is before the industry had a standard sized bearing and axle like they do now. He saves up his money waiting tables in Encinitas at a local diner. And in 1973, he goes to Creative Urethane and gets them to start making his very own skateboard wheel company called Cadillac Wheel Company. A lot of people thought he named it after the car company, but he 
actually named it after a dog food company that he saw on TV. From there, he sets out to sell them up and down the coast of California to all different surf shops. Unfortunately, most people weren't interested. They thought the price point was too high and the industry was dominated by clay wheels. So he starts giving away Cadillac wheels to the best skaters that he meets and he starts running ads in the local surf magazines. Once people got to ride the product, it was obvious that they were miles ahead from anything else in the market. This single invention exploded the skateboard industry again after its death. And of course, it changed everything. It unlocked what was possible on a skateboard and where you could ride it. This new wheel unlocked an explosion of skateboard tricks and skateboard inventions. And of course, all that success and money brought new competition and a new load of brands. After the success of the Cadillac wheel, the world's first polyurethane wheel, in 1974, Santa Cruz introduced the Road Rider wheel. This is the first skateboard wheel with a precision bearing inside, which means every time you change your wheels, you don't have to chase the ball bearings around on the ground. Another gigantic leap forwards for skateboard technology. These were so popular that by a year later, they had sold a million sets. And the urethane wheel and sealed bearing is exploding and sending more brands onto the market. Nas where they decides his time in the sun was over and he goes back and gets a bachelor degree in science. He ends up getting a job with Hewlett Packard and he ends up inventing many things and creating many patents. In the late 1970s, there's a drought across California, forcing people to empty their pools and this causes skateboarding to explode even further. But this wasn't the only happy accident that happened in the late 70s. Around this time, a guy by the name of George Powell was experimenting with inventions in his garage and home. After getting his master's in product design, George Powell gets a job at Hewlett Packard. He leaves there and starts working for a defense contractor, which is also where he's introduced to polyurethane. And he eventually gets a job in the aerospace industry, but then he gets let go. From there, he decides to follow his dream of making skateboard products. So in 1977, he founds the Powell Corporation. It's interesting to note that a year later, Stacy Peralta joins him and they change the name to Powell Peralta. They make a great team because Stacy is the skater and marketing guy and George Powell is the inventor. George parallels the invention of the skateboard urethane wheel with the change of steam power to electricity. George decides that he wants to invent a new shape and urethane for skateboard wheels. He designs a wheel with large radius and firm edges and he calls it the double radio. This is the shape that skateboard wheels are based off of today. Round. <laughs> <laughs> So he gives this new wheel shape to Tom Sims and some of the Sims team riders at the time to try out. And they say they don't really notice the difference and they don't care. So he goes back to the drawing board and he decides he has to design a new urethane to change the game. So he starts researching different urethanes and company catalogs to find a formula that interests him. He tried factories all over the US to see if they would pour this for him, but no one would. Because this formula had a different ratio of curative to urethane, it was hard to pour and no one wanted to try to test it for him. He finds a place that would test pour it for him in LA and when he gets the product back, he was shocked. The wheels looked nothing like anything else on the market. The wheels were white and opaque instead of the clear colorful wheels that everyone else was making on the market. And these wheels got dubbed the bones because they were the color of human bones. Pair that with some spooky skeleton marketing and you have a winning formula. When he rode them, he could tell they were different and he was on the right track. These wheels were harder, they had better rebound and they were unlike anything else on the market. He got the team riding them and he got so much positive feedback because they were way faster. In 1982, some rookie pros are added onto the scene. You might recognize them. Gator, Lance Mountain, Tony Hawk and Christian Asoy. These guys are taking over and becoming all-stars. Meanwhile, in the mid 80s in the streets of California, a new revelation is taking form called street skateboarding. Guys are taking freestyle tricks and tricks invented by Rodney Mullen and adapting them to the streets of the city. Some of the early street skaters were guys like Nottis, Gons, Tommy Guerrero, Jim T, Frankie Hill, Mike V, and Ray Barbie. In the late 80s, a seismic shift happens once again and Steve Rocco founds World Industries. In 1989, World Industries releases the Mike V Animal Farm deck. This is a huge change of skateboard shapes forever and it's designed by Rodney Mullen with the inspiration from a freestyle deck. This is the foreshadowing of street skateboarding taking over. And obviously this new style of skateboarding is gonna require a new style of wheel. The 90s is where we see one of the strangest phenomenons in skateboard history. In the 80s, people were riding big wheels. We're talking 58 to 65 millimeter wheels. And as street skateboarding came in, the wheels shrunk instantly. And in 1992, we hit an era which has been dubbed the big pants, small wheels era. As street skating became more technical, people felt like a smaller wheel meant you can manipulate your board easier. The most 
most famous of these wheels was the Real Skateboard's Real Small Wheels. Most wheels in 92 were hovering in the 40s range. But then, Pal Peralta came out with an even smaller wheel. They called it Baby Balls, and it was a 39 millimeter wheel. There were even rumors that brands like Stereo, World Industries, and Spitfire made it an even smaller wheel at 37 millimeters. In 1986, there's a Bones, Rat Bones wheel ad that features Jim Thebo, and his name is horribly misspelled. We can't confirm or deny this, but this is probably the reason why he left just one year later to start Spitfire Wheels. Although they didn't start until 1987, it was a slow burn for them to become the most dominant wheel company on the market. In 1988, they come out with their first print ad in Thrasher, and that's where we see the first Swirl logo. At the time, Spitfire was owned by a record label distributor, and the Swirl logo paid homage to the record label. They let out a few different ads with a few different logos. In 1989, they let out their first ad with a skater, and his name was Keith Cochran. Although they experimented with lots of logos over the years, none would stick like the famous Big Head logo. Designed by Kevin Ansel, this logo wouldn't show up until an ad in May of 1992. And interesting enough, when it showed up, it was almost like the logo wanted to look like the Swirl logo. Spitfire's growth seemed to be a slow burn, but it always had a cult following and an amazing team. It wasn't until the invention of the Formula 4 in the 2010s that Spitfire took the lead as the biggest brand. Wheels are a really tough market. There's tons of brands that have come and gone over the years. We've seen brands like Hubba, Pig Wheels, Dark Star, Gold Wheels, Autobahn, Landspeed, Momentum, even board brands are doing wheels like Zero and Baker, Girl Chocolate. And some of these guys made it for a certain time. And then they passed away or they slowed way down. The thing is, making a wheel company is so tough. Unless you're creating a new urethane that people catch on and love, it's really hard to survive. As we move into the 2020s, an era of self-driving cars, wearable tech, and Tim Hortons making pizzas, it's nice to know that wheels are still progressing. Even if the industry seems like it's being dominated by three major players, Bones, Spitfire, and OJs, it's nice to see that they're experimenting with new formulas. In recent years, we've seen Spitfire Formula 4s, which are still dominating. We've seen the Dragon Formula from Powell, which shook the entire industry up in 2022. It got remade into the Bones X Formula in 2023. And more recently, we've seen the OJ Double Duros. It's nice to see that there's a wheel for literally anyone, any style of skating, because these wheels are rolling for you, bud. What wheels are you currently riding? Do you like them? and why, let us know below. If you like these videos, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. It helps us make more of these videos for you guys. Guys, thanks so much for watching. I'm Levi, this is Shred Shop, connect you to skateboarding, and you just watch the history of the skateboard wheel. Stay tuned for comment of the week. Oh, we got a spicy one. It's from my dog, Charismatic. It's on one of our videos. It says, hey, yo, since when did Justin Bieber and MGK have a kid? I gotta say guys, I'd much rather get this than being compared to Jason Mewes and Badger. But I love the doppelganger mentions because I'm sexy and these two are, and those other two are ugly. Like you're gonna win parent of the year because your kid's just gonna love you so much and then you, sorry, and then you just. That like went through the mic like <laughs> And then you just.